So then, yeah, I guess, uh, Nina, you can go ahead and, and start. Yeah, it's going to be Fred uh, and I actually presenting on the same slides. So I'm going to uh, let Fred start. Thanks. Yeah, so, so I'm Fred. Um, so today, Nina and I are going to present our work on the estimation of orientation and camera parameters from uh, cryo-electron microscopy images. Uh, with VAEs and GANs, so that's uh, probably a little different uh, for you all, but uh, we'll try to explain a little bit. So um, we, we'll start with some very brief um, background on, on, on what, what we mean by cryo-electron microscopy here. Um, and, and then uh, we're not going to talk about all kinds of electron microscopy. It will be very specific to one uh, um, that basically targets the goal of reconstructing um, um, biomolecules volumes uh, from 2D images. Um, and it turns out that there is a, an interesting geometry behind the, this imaging process. Uh, so uh, Nina will uh, explain it to you and, and, uh, and in a second stage. And, and, um, and that's where the VAE and GAN approach comes in um, and, and, and we'll show you how it worked on simulated data and then real data uh, collected at Slack um, toward the end. Um, so first, a little uh, introduction uh, about what we are imaging. There's this beautiful hand uh, drawing that I made. Uh, yeah, uh, so essentially the way it works is uh, if you're a biologist, you get cells to express um, the, the molecule that you're interested in, typically a protein. And then you um, purify that protein out of the cell. And to put it in the, in the microscope, you basically um, uh, make a thin layer of water with the, mo the molecules uh, uh, dispersed all over it. And then you freeze that and you shoot electrons through it. So basically what the electrons will see is a field of molecules that are all almost identical up to a rotation. Um, so the first uh, quantity of interest is that uh, you, you are imaging something up to rotation. So that's, that's the first unknown in our problem. Um, then there are other difficulties. Uh, the, the second difficulty being that you are actually uh, projecting the, the, the density of your object in real space, uh, which is equivalent to uh, actually collecting uh, a Fourier slice, uh, I mean, a slice in, in Fourier space. Um, and and um, by basically, uh, um, having sufficient, um, basically rotating the molecule in real space corresponds to like rotating the slice in, 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 in Fourier space. Uh, and the third difficulty is that um, the, um, the imaging process is um, corruptive, uh, which means there are two, side, two, two, two origins of that corruption. The first one is that you are blurring your image with the CTF, the, the contrast transfer, the point spread function of your microscope. And, and, and that, um, Many, many. There are many types of. Um, um, say this takes many shapes, but the main uh, parameter that enters in this is the defocus between the image plane and the detector plane, and and um, and that's something you don't really you know. You 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 want to estimate that, and finally you are corrupting your images because there is a lot of noise uh, from the detector, uh, the the electron gun, and and uh, surrounding water, which is the main. Uh, actually what's, what's most prominent in your sample. Um, so that's the image formation model um, when you are using um, electron microscopy to uh, image proteins, essentially. And, and um, obviously what you want to do is to inverse it. And, and, um, and that's um, uh, the reconstruction problem is, is, is ill-posed, right? For many reasons, first uh, we go from 2D to 3D, then it's noise. It's very noisy. Uh, so uh, traditionally, it's been solved uh, iteratively. Um, so basically, you would compare each image of your data set to a reference model that evolves uh, as you get better and better. But that's that's very very slow, and and um, and it can take quite a while to converge. Um, and also, it's uh, bound to be problematic as the data sets grow. Uh, we might have some kind of scalability challenge at some point. So um, when we started chatting with Nina, we asked ourselves whether we could leverage some uh, interesting geometry uh, in the images to bypass the need for comparing all the time with a reference. 
uh, and and um, that might offer a position uh, a solution to scale better essentially yes thank you fred so fred introduced the uh, basic principles of cryoelectron microscopy and the image formation model and told you that uh, the reconstruction of the 3D shape of the biomolecules is actually quite computationally expensive. So here we're going to present a method that aims to do to reach the same goal, but hopefully faster. And the method that we propose is a combination of geometry and the variational to encoder and generative adversarial network neural net. So just in a few words before we get into the next slides, what we're going to do is we are going to give a geometric interpretation of the latent space of the variation autoencoder. And using this geometry, we're going to be able to reconstruct uh, the, the biomolecules. So just to set up the notations a little bit. So we're going to have these cryo -EM images. Here I've shown uh, three cryo -EM images, which are 2D images. We call them XI. And so for each of these image, images XI, our goal is to estimate the rotation, RI, that represents the 3D orientation of the biomolecule uh, that has been uh, imaged. So this is illustrated on the right. You have the 3D biomolecule uh, through which an electron beam is shot, and RI represents this 3D orientation of the biomolecule. And the second parameter that we want to estimate is what we call DI, and it stands for the defocus of the camera. So you can see that the molecule on the, in this image on the top right again, the molecule is trapped in a 3D orientation. And then what we get is a 2D image of its shadow, which is what's represented in the three big images on the top of the screen. And how blurry these images are gonna be depends on a parameter, which we call the defocus. And if we know both the orientation and RI, RI and the defocus DI of each image XI, then that's what's illustrated on the bottom right, we can, hope to reconstruct the biomolecule. And so in order to estimate these two parameters, the orientation and defocus, that we call latent variables actually, we're gonna use geometry. So let me introduce some elements of geometry. I said that the geometry that we're gonna use is gonna be the geometry of the latent space of the variational autoencoder to come. But before talking about the geometry of the latent space of the variational autoencoder, let me talk about the geometry of the space of images. So without any notion of variational autoencoder so far. So what is the geometry of this space of cryo-EM images? So let's take one image. It's a 2D cryo-EM uh, EM image X that has a given rotation and a given defocus. So that's the image X that's illustrated on the bottom in this uh, green uh, frame. Now, this image has a rotation, but we can make the group of 2D rotations of other rotation act on this image. And if we do that with another rotation, for example, R prime, what it does is that it rotates the image. And if we take all the possible R primes, then we get what's called an orbit. We get this dashed circle here. It represents the space of all the images that we will get by making the 2D rotation R primes act on the original image. And so we can uh, also think about doing that on another image. We this will generate another circle. And so group theory there, for this space of uh, cryo -EM images. So by the way, here it's represented in R2, but this is just a sch sch schematic illustration. This space R2 actually represents the whole space of images, and we're interested in the geometry of the space of cryo -EM images within that space of images, just represented as R2 for uh, convenience. But still, what uh, group theory tells us is two things. First, the orbit of X which is, remember, this dash green circle, is actually a circle, so one-dimensional circle in this high-dimensional space of images. And then if we take another image, it's going to be another circle. And so how are these circles related? Well, the images that have more symmetry will have a circle of smaller radius. The orbit of the images with more symmetry will have a circle of smaller radius as their orbit. And this can be illustrated by the extreme case, which is called the singularity, which is this purple dot here. If we were to take, let's say it's a cryo EM images, it's not, so just for the purple of the purpose of the uh, argument. If we take a 2D cryo EM image that will be uh, with a rotational symmetry here, the orbit of this image is just a point. It's, not, it's a circle with radius zero, because if we make the whole group of rotation act on this purple image, we only get that point. It doesn't change this image to have a rotation act on it. And so, Group theory tells us that in this high dimensional space of images, 
the space of cryo EM images is actually organized into these concentric circles. And for one image on one circle, the defocus is related to the radius of the circle, and the rotation of the image is related to the angle that defines the position of that image on this circle. So we have this proposition. First, the space of noise-free 2D images is stratified into orbits isomorphic to circles. Here we have images without the noise. But when we add noise, we're going to just add a perturbation of it. So the real cryo EM images will be perturbation of this stratification as circles. So even if the space of images is very high dimensional, the space of cryo EM images is organized into circles modulo the modulation that is the noise. So now we've established that for the space of cryo EM images. I told you that we're going to leverage that in the latest space of a variational to encoder. So let's see how the VAE variational to encoder comes in. So here you have a schematic representation of a variational to encoder. I'm going to introduce in principle and then uh, give our main hypothesis that the latent space of this VAE is itself stratified into circles. So the VAE takes an image XI, encodes it into a latent variable CI that is typically of low dimension. So even though the space of images is very high dimensional, we want the ZI to have a low dimension. And then there is a decoder part that takes the latent variable ZI and decodes it back into a reconstructed image XI hat. And if the variation autoencoder is well trained, our hope is that X hat, XI hat will be as close as possible to the original image XI. And if that's the case, it means that the latent variable ZI has captured everything that was relevant to be decoded into a cryo-EM image. It has captured the main characteristics of the cryo-EM image. So now, why do we expect the latent space to be stratified into circles as the ambient space, space was stratified into circles? Well, that has to do with the decoder here, which is basically just a function because it's a neural network. So I have, I've given here the, the equation of that function. But it's basically just a function that takes the i from the latent space and that embeds it as xi hat in the ambient space. So if we use another illustration to understand what's going on, it goes like this. So you have the illustration on the right, where this time the latent space is represented as a 1D space for the purpose of illustration. And the ambient space is again represented as a R2, just for the purpose of illustration. So what the decoder does is it takes the i and embeds it as fw, so mu w, these are the bias and weights of the neural network, the i, and it becomes this blue point here in the ambient space. And if we were to embed the whole latent space, we will get this submanifold in light green of the ambient space. And then xi hat is generated from that. And so during training, because we want to get latent variables that are able to reconstruct the original cryo EM images. What, what the decoder is going to do is going to fit this uh, manifold in light green to be as close as possible to the distribution of cryo EM images in ambient space. So basically the latent space, R, will be transformed through the decoder to give a space of some curvature. And this space of some curvature will try to be as close as possible to the space of cryo EM images within the total space of images. And because the space of cryo EM images is stratified into orbits, this latent space transformed in ambient space will capture these concentric circles if the VAE is well trained. And so our main hypothesis is that if the VAE is well, if well trained, we should see the circles in the latent space, in the 2D latent space, if we, if we choose two latent variables, in the 2D latent space, uh, of the variational autoencoder. And now if that's the case, if we see the circles, then we can do the same strategy, which is using the latent polar coordinates, so ZI transformed into polar coordinates to estimate the defocus and the rotation. Basically, we take one image projecting in the latent space, then compute its distance to the origin, that will give us defocus, and then compute an angle that will give us its rotation. So in practice, uh, this is the last function and the architecture that we use uh, for this uh, method. So the, re the loss of the variational to encoder, it's a sum of a reconstruction loss. So basically how close is XI hat from the original image XI and the regularization. 
for the reconstruction, we do not use some distance between images. So we, can, we could have used any notion of distance between xi hat and xi, but instead we use an adversarial net. So we implement a discriminator that will take xi hat and xi as inputs and try to distinguish them. And if it cannot distinguish them, then it gives a notion of similarity between xi hat and xi. So that's where the GAN comes in, in the reconstruction loss. And then the regularization uh, loss of the variation over to encoder. And what's interesting is that this loss is an upper bound of the negative log likelihood of the generative model. And that's just a point that I make here to just to compare our method to the state of the art in a, in a few seconds. So that's for the loss. In terms of architecture, we use convolutional layers. Uh, with, we try different number of layers for the decoder and also convolutional layers for the discriminator. And we perform hyperparameter search using biasm optimization and early stopping. And actually it was really interesting because without the hyperparameter search, we will see concentric shapes, uh, concentric 1D curves, closed curves in the latent space, but not exactly circles. But as soon as we did hyperparameter search, and this is a spoiler for the next slide, but we do see uh, the, the circles. And so to compare our approach to the state of the art, uh, we expect this approach to be faster for the following reason. So as Fred said, the state of the art is an expectation maximization approach that also computes some latent variable and also use that latent variable to reconstruct the volume. But the difference between EM and VGAN, which is what we do, EM compute a sample from the exact posterior of this latent variable. And sampling from this exact posterior in a Monte Carlo fashion is very computationally expensive. And so in a nutshell, what we do, instead of sampling from an exact posterior, we compute an approximate posterior via optimization. So this is the variational inference paradigm from the variational to encoder. And this is expected to be 10 times faster on average, depending on your set architecture, depending on many parameters, but replacing a sampling by an optimization is faster in general. So that was the reasoning behind uh, our method. Now, because of this advantage of variational inference, other um, uh, teams have uh, used variational inference to uh, reconstruct 3D shapes in cryoelectron microscopy. So I'm gonna compare our method with the two main related works. The first related work is called CryoDGRN, and uh, their neural network architecture is illustrated here on the right. Uh, it's a very interesting work because in the latent variable that represent the cryoEM image, not only they learn a rotation, but they also learn the conformation, which means the global shape of the ballon molecule. And second, they are able to reconstruct the cryo-EM volume, so the biomolecule that you can see here on, on the right, uh, in an end-to-end -end fashion. So that's also uh, very interesting. But the, the problem is that this work is not fully leveraging variational inference. So they still sample to estimate the rotation, and they do variational inference under on the conformation, only on the conformation. So you have two types of latent variables and they do something on one and optimization on the other one. So it's still slower to what we uh, hope to be able to do. And second thing is that they perform, they, they implement these neural networks in Fourier space. So we use the Quora EM image itself, which is why we can use convolutional layers. And this is great because this is uh, faster. In uh, the difference here is that they first transform the image in Fourier space and then perform run the neural network in Fourier space. And because they do that, they cannot use convolutional neural network. Instead, they need to use fully connected neural network. And that's also potentially slower. So even though it's a great end-to-end -end architecture, we think that there are specific points in which we can improve speed. And this is why we, we propose our approach. And then the uh, other one, uh, other related work is called CryoGAN, like in Generative Adversarial Network. And this is also a very interesting uh, work that reconstructs the 3D volume of the biomolecule that you can see uh, in, the green, in the black background here. Uh, but the, the drawback of this approach, even though it can reconstruct the volume, is that it, lo it loses the, variational, the latent variable. So it's only a GAN and not a VAE in that approach. And therefore, to each image, we don't have a notion of what was the rotation of that image, what was the uh, defocus of that image, what was the conformation or the shape of the biomolecule on that image. And so for later analysis, 
it's somehow less powerful because we've aggregated all of this information into one volume. So in contrast, we don't use physics, so we just use an abstract model, which is a neural network, to learn the rotation latent variable and the defocus fully via variational inference. And we do that by leveraging the geometry of the latent space that allows us to disentangle the rotation latent variable from other latent variables, such as the defocus in our case. So I've uh, introduced the method that we use, which is a combination of variational to encoder again, but leveraging the geometry of the latent space to estimate these two uh, parameters, which are the rotation and the defocus. So I'm going to let Fran present our results on simulated and real data. Thanks. Yeah, so, so we first applied um, Vegan to simulated data where we had control over um, the range of defocus of each image. And, and um, we also were able this way to remove the noise part of the problem. Uh, so here, for example, we have about uh, 2,500 images um, of given size, um, six defocuses that we knew exactly for each image. And um, as, as you can see in the first uh, training epoch, uh, basically Vegan is only able to learn a very low frequency component of the image. But as it trains, you see more and more uh, high frequency features. Um, and and uh, at the end, you, 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 you get a reconstruction that's um, almost indistinguishable from the, the data. And that, that's here showing one uh, image, but obviously that applies to the whole range. Uh, so when we saw that, we were uh, pretty, pretty confident. Uh, but what's really interesting is um, that when you look at the latent space, um, so that you can see on the right here, um, it, um, you can see that it is stratified in circles. So that, that was a validation of the geometric uh, hypothesis for us. Um, from from um, an, an operative standpoint, we see that uh, essentially the, the polar coordinates in that space, in the latent space, could really be used to estimate the orientation of the object. Uh, and, and, and this with an error below two degrees, um, as well as a defocus value uh, at which the, the, the image was simulated with, with an error of less than 200 nanometers, um, which, uh, I mean, the, the range that is explored experimentally is between 500 and 2,500 nanometers. So that's, that was comforting uh, for us. Um, but then obviously we wanted to try on real data. So we had, uh, being at Slack, we have access to some uh, uh, microscopes and some data. So, so we, we asked for some. So we have five here, for example, 5,000 images uh, downsampled. Uh, but this time we don't really know the camera parameters. I mean, we don't control them. We, we, we can estimate them through other methods, but we don't really know them. And there is a lot of noise. Um, so for this case, uh, essentially, um, we see that um, it converged in uh, 85 iterations, so a bit more. But essentially, um, we get the same kind of behavior where we first learn the low frequency component and, and more and more high frequency stuff as we go. Interestingly, um, the, the end result is not exactly the, the, the input data. It's, uh, it's a denoise version of it. So that, that's uh, interesting also from a user perspective, like to, to be able maybe to understand what's in their sample. Um, so as, as in the simulated case, we see that during training, uh, uh, we, we had the same kind of behavior. Now, what does uh, the latent space look like? So in, in this case, um, we have a slight difference in that um, real data is messy. So we have, we have some bad apples. So uh, here we show that first we, we, we can use the latent space to, to detect the bad apples and remove them uh, in, a, in a robust fashion. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the part on the left here uh, in the middle, um, the, the distance is the color code. And so whatever is uh, too red uh, gets trashed and, and, and we keep the rest. And then we, um, we do a principal component analysis on, on, on what remains again. And, uh, Interestingly, we, we get something that's quite circular again. So on, on the right, you can see the latent space um, colored uh, according to the defocus in the um, upper right uh, triangle and uh, the orientation in the lower right. Uh, in this case, the defocus and the orientation were estimated with uh, Relion, which is kind of a state of the art uh, expectation maximization approach we mentioned. And, and we see that we have a good correlation qualitatively between uh, the radius and the defocus and the angle and, uh, and the polar angle. So that's, uh, that was 
reassuring. Now, quantitatively, uh, we show um, that we can estimate on this data set um, uh, angle ribbon error uh, between 20 and 40 degrees, um, depending on the case, and the defocus ribbon error in the 500 nanometer range. So this must be understood in the context that Began only saw the unsampled version of the data, while the uh, ground truth were obtained on the fully sampled data. So um, it, re it remains to be seen how, th how this improves with um, uh, upsampled data compared to what we have here. Um, also, some views are more challenging due to intrinsic symmetries. Uh, so we are still working on automatic ways to detect symmetries. Uh, uh, for example, uh, some, a lot of biological objects have some rotational symmetry, C2, C3, um, that makes the prediction challenging, the estimation challenging. Um, right, just, and more generally, yes, I just, think we're reaching. Yeah, if, if you can wrap up, you're, you're yeah, a few yeah, minutes yeah. past. Okay, already, okay. <laughs> so uh, we're now benchmarking, benchmarking the method on, on other data sets, and, and, um, and all, all that we showed today was 2D, but we also have like uh, initial results in, in 3D. So yeah, uh, I think we can conclude. <laughs> so as a conclusion, uh, since many cryo-EM microscopes are installed in, around the world following the Nobel Prize that was given to cryo-EM uh, in 2017, you have many more cryo-EM images that are produced. And that's great, like this explosion of data, as you can see uh, on this graph from Slack, which is the uh, total uh, cumulative data volume from cryo-EM at Slack. This explosion of data is great because if you have more images, cryo-EM images to reconstruct one shape, then you can have higher resolution in the reconstructed biological shape. So we, there is actually a need for faster method, which is what motivated uh, this work. Uh, but so this work was a proof of concept. We showed that we can use geometry to reconstruct, to uh, estimate the rotation and the focus to later reconstruct the biomolecule. But as Fred say, we did it on done sampled images. So now we need to benchmark it uh, against fully sampled images to see if we uh, get that, that, that accuracy and then benchmark uh, the actual speed because we expect the same times speed up, but we need to, to benchmark that. But uh, still, this talk is the first polyvirational method that estimates orientation and defocus, and we are pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, so if you, yeah. Yeah. So you, we were a little over, but we do have a small bit of time for questions because it started late. Uh, do you want to say something before that, Chris, or should I go straight into the questions? Um, just that people can post or upvote. So upvote will help us since we have limited time. Yes. Um, so right now, the top voted uh, question from Scott, what benefits do you expect to get from using a GAN instead of a simple distance metric for input output image similarity? Yeah, so thank you. That's a, uh, a great question. So I've used the um, GANs in my in my previous work um, um, uh, with the variation auto encoder. And uh, using GANs is basically as if it was learning uh, the distance that the that is the optimal distance that you may want to use between xi hat and xi. So instead, obviously, you might not want to use the mean squared error because there is so much noise. But you could think about using uh, some kind of uh, distances on images. But doing it with again is putting another flexibility to your model that allows to learn the reconstruction loss or the distance between images as you go. And so uh, using that especially in my previous work, uh, really improved the reconstruction. So the reconstruction was sharper uh, using the GAN as the reconstruction loss. Um, and because of the, the VAE are known to like reconstruct images, but always being a bit blurry. And there is some research trying to understand why the reconstructions are a bit blurry. But using a GAN as a reconstruction, reconstruction loss um, uh, help fighting that blurriness. And since our images were already extremely noisy and we wanted to see uh, fine details in the, in the long term, we, we used that, that, that GAN. Uh, so, but yeah, we should also try with or without GAN and see if we can really see a difference. I think this difference is gonna come when we go to uh, images of finer resolution. So we downsample the images Great. to have the proof of concept, but I think this will really come into play with finer resolution. Uh, Let's do one more. Yeah. One more question. Uh, since you use polar coordinates, do you have any weird issues with wraparound, i.e. 2 pi equals 0, and how do you encode the boundary condition? Um, no, we didn't have issue, although, uh, no, we don't have issue, but 
um, when you see, for example, these plots, that's where uh, the the circular um, the yeah the circle of the polar genetic comes from. So here it, it's a plot where you have the true in-plane rotation and the polar angle in latent space. And if the estimation was perfect, you expect to see the first diagonal. But actually, you see something in two parts. This is because it's wrapping around. This is because it's, it's ill-posed, basically. You don't know why you're going to put the zero degree origin of your circle. And so there is a little lag between what you estimate and what is the truth. You're going to be translated by whatever the origin of the circle was. So at first, we were surprised by this, but actually, it makes sense. And though we didn't have uh, problems with this, maybe it's because our circle is embedded in R2. It's actually completely continuous in R2. So we didn't have uh, that problem. And we also, when we estimate the uh, root mean square error, we do it modulo to pi. And so we don't have that problem. All right. Um, so we don't do you wanna... have any more time or? Well, why don't you read out the next question? I'm going to steal the screen sharing and get the next person yeah. set up while they okay. answer the last uh, one. Yes. So the next question, is there a blur threshold where the image is too blurry and you expect your reconstruction to be not representative of the original image? Um, so we, we didn't look at any blur threshold, uh, but it's true that the, so maybe if I do know that better than me, but depending on the noise level and the blur threshold, you can only reconstruct the image at a certain resolution. So it's not black and white. It's more like depending on how many images you have, depending on the blur threshold and depending on the noise level, you can only, you can only go that far. And what we want to tackle in terms of res resolution here is increasing the number of images. Uh, because that increases the resolution at a given blur threshold and at a given uh, noise level. Uh, but I, I, I don't know about the uh, phase change. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for the, the very nice talk. In all of these workshops, we, uh, I always feel that I, w I wish we had more time. You go, you start to fill everything uh, up. But anyway, sorry about also being a stickler for time. So next oh, up is you. Scott uh, talking about Lux.